Hello, how are you all? Um, everybody is studiously working right now, and that is okay. Um, you guys go ahead and keep filling those things out while I'm talking. Uh, okay, show this on the screen if you would. Um, what I have here is we are not having a quiz today over the classification of cash flows. But I wanted to do this practice quiz. Actually, let's, let's just back up a little bit if you would uh, show the slides here. Okay? We talked about the introduction to the cash flow statement last time and what it does. And then we talked about how there are three very important sections of the cash flow statement. There's the operating section that shows operating activities, the investing section that shows the investing activities, and the financing that shows the financing activities. The key thing is to um, be able to look at a cash flow and know what type of uh, cash flow it is. Is this an operating cash flow? Is this an investing cash flow? Is this a financing cash flow? All right, and I gave you the examples, whoops, there's my writing still, um, of operating cash flows are those things that happen in the daily operations of business. They're very repetitive, okay? Then I gave you the three most common investing cash flows and the three most common financing cash flows. And I talked about how investing cash flows have to do with long-term items on the left side of the accounting <laughs> equation. Okay, these are all long-term assets. And I talked about how financing cash flows have to do with long-term items on the right side of the accounting equation. Is that correct? Okay. Now, it's very important to, to know that. Now, um, going back to this, what I want, wanted you to all do was take this as a practice quiz. Um, we're not going to go over the answers now. Uh, you folks at home, this should be in your handout packet. But uh, the answers are down below. Okay? The answers are down below. So sometime, you don't have to do it now because there's actually something we need to talk about um, before you do it for you folks at home. You guys here could, could play with it a little bit. Um, but you can come off of that. This is always an area that people think they understand and they don't. Okay? As I said last period, you can't construct a balance sheet if you don't know whether you put a certain account in the asset, the liability, or the equity section. Well, you can't do a meaningful cash flow statement if you don't know whether to put a certain cash flow in the operating, investing, or uh, financing section. Okay? Now, <laughs> There's one more category that I want to talk about, and I intentionally did not talk about it last time, okay? Um, and that is this section right here. There are some transactions that do not have any cash flow, no cash inflow, no cash outflow. But they're significant enough that we have to, have to actually disclose them in a footnote to the cash flow statement, okay? Examples of this would be, um, let's say we owed somebody, let's say we owed a bank uh, $100,000 in debt. And we talked to the bank and we agreed uh, they would forgive our debt if we gave them 35,000 shares of our stock. Well, that is a significant transaction that just occurred, but, but note, there was no cash that changed hands, was there? Okay. Another example in looking at the slide. Conversion of preferred stock to common stock. Or um, let's say you buy a piece of land and it's entirely on credit. Well, what would that journal entry look like? You would debit land and you would credit long-term notes payable, right? There's no cash being increased or decreased. But these are significant enough transactions that even though they do not require cash flows, you have to disclose them on a footnote to the cash flow statement if they're material. Now, if they're not material, if you buy a computer monitor for $200 on credit, that, that's not material enough. But if it's a major transaction, you have to disclose it. The main reason they have this rule is they don't want you to try to, um, they don't want you to try to construct transactions that don't involve cash so that you can kind of 
obscure them from the readers. So you can hide them from the readers. Does that make sense? So this is another category that you should be aware of. Okay. Now, go, if you go to this practice handout again, um, I actually have a few non-cash uh, transactions in there. And like I said, the answers are at the bottom. Okay. The answers are at the bottom. But I don't want you to, uh, to look at those. Okay. So our quiz, folks, will be next period. You with me? At the very beginning of next period. But students always think they know this. Oh, I think I have the classification of cash flows down. Great. And then I want you to, to do this. And if you get these all right, well, then you do have them down. But if you miss six or five or four or more, you don't have them down. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do now, oh, and I also, I emailed you, last, last period I gave you some basic, basic uh, flashcards to learn, didn't I? And I think there were just two pages of them, right? And they were overall broad categories, okay? I also have some more specific advanced flashcards that you can use if you want, okay? Did you see that I emailed that to you guys? Okay, I don't print those out because it's five pages and some people aren't going to use them anyway. For you folks at home, you'll either have those in your handouts or just tell me and I'll email those to you. But those are the advanced flashcards. They're a little bit more specific. So instead of saying buying or selling a fixed asset and have that be one flashcard in the basics, the advanced, they might have several. Sell a truck, buy a parcel of land, um, you know, purchase a, a vehicle. I get more specific. Does that make sense? So there's obviously more of them. But if you can have those advanced cash flows, uh, advanced uh, flashcards for cash flows down, then you're in pretty good shape. But those should be waiting in your email box. Okay? Cool? All right, let me see my notes here, make sure I cover everything I want to do. Okay. Um, I want to show you one thing real quick. This is on, you don't have to turn in your books if you don't want to, folks, but uh, this is on page 655 in the textbook, okay? I want you to note that this is a cash flow statement, okay? This is a cash flow statement, and I want you to notice that it is, try to get the glare off of there, there are three sections, operating, investing, and financing, just like I told you, right? Well, and look at the amounts that they arrive at. The, the cash in regards to operating activities is 79725. For investing, it's negative 3525. And for financing, it's negative 57075. Okay? Now, if it's a positive number, we say it's net cash provided by that activity. If it's a negative number, we say it's net cash used in that activity. Okay? Now, there's three, there's three sections, and these are the three numbers, right? If you look at the next page, they have a similar cash flow statement, and it also has three sections, operating, investing, and financing, and they arrive at the same three numbers. So what is the difference between these two cash flow statements? Well, this, this one, uh, this cash flow statement on page 656. This is constructed using the direct method. And the difference between the direct method and the indirect method is just how they arrive at this number right here. Okay? Look at this one. 79725. Look at the previous page. Again, it's 79725. But the way they arrived at that operating cash flow number is different. Do you see that? The bottom half is exactly the same between both of these statements. This is called the indirect method, the way they arrived at the 79725 on page 655. This is the direct method. They arrive at the same number, it's just done in a different way. Do you see that? Okay. Keep that in mind as we go through these next slides. Okay. 
There's two acceptable methods to determining your cash flows from operating activities, okay? There's two acceptable methods to determining cash flows from operating activities. There's the direct and there's the indirect. I just showed you that, right? But in my class, you're only responsible for learning the indirect method. And why is that? Because that almost everybody uses the indirect method. I, I hardly ever see the direct method. I can't remember the last time I saw the direct method used. So remember, the only, re the only way that those two differ is how they arrive <coughs> at the operating cash flows number. They both arrive at the same number. But you only have to learn the indirect method in my class. So what we are going to do today, the task before us, is we are going to learn the indirect method for preparing the cash flows from operating activities. The cash flows from operating activities section. Okay? So what we are going to do is we're going to learn this section right here. Okay? Right here. That's how we're, we're going to learn today. Now, if you do what I ask you to do, you will learn it well. But if you take shortcuts, it's going to be harder. Okay? I know how to teach this section. So listen to me, okay? We're going to concentrate on this slide right here. Now, let me explain this slide. Well, first of all, let me ask you two questions. We've got net income right here, correct? What financial statement do we pull net income off of? Yes, that should be an easy one. The net income comes off the income statement. Is that correct? Okay. Now, the income statement, is that prepared on the accrual basis of accounting or on the cash basis of accounting? That is correct. It is prepared on the accrual basis of accounting. Okay. So what we are going to do, we have this net income number that we pulled off of the income statement, which was prepared on the accrual basis. We are going to do three sets of changes to that number. Okay? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to deal with our non-cash expenses. Then what we're going to do is we're going to deal with our losses and gains. And then what we're going to do is we're going to deal with our changes in our current assets and current liabilities. Now, once we do these three things to it, what we're going to get is a new number, and that will be our cash flows from operating activities. Are you with me? In a way, think of this cash flow from operating activities at this point in your learning. In a way, think of this cash flows from operating activities similar to the net income if we would have not used the accrual basis of accounting, but rather the cash basis of accounting. Okay? Let me say that again. I want you to think of this cash flows from operating activities as the net income number if we would have used the cash basis of accounting rather than the accrual basis. Okay? Now we're starting off with net income from the income statement, which is on the accrual basis, but we're going to do these three things to it, and, out, and on the other side is going to be this number right here. Now we're not just interested in calculating the number alone. We want to show how we arrived at that number. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we're going to do is this. The first thing we're going to do is deal with non-cash expenses. Non-cash expenses. Well, what the heck is a non-cash expense? Well, let's talk about that. Okay? Let me go over to the Elmo. Okay? So, we have... We have uh, an income statement, right? for a certain period of time. And we know that this was prepared on the accrual basis, right? Okay. And you know how an income statement looks, right? You have your revenues, you know, different revenues listed. You have your expenses, have different expenses listed, right? 
And then at some point down here you have, let's say revenues were greater than expenses. And so we have a net income number. Let's just make it an easy number. Let's say net income is, was $100,000 for this period. Are you with me? Okay. So that net income of 100000 was arrived at using the accrual method of accounting. Okay. However, there were some expenses perhaps in here that were, that were what we call non-cash expenses. For example, let's say that we had depreciation expense and let's say that it was two thousand dollars. Okay? So I want you to understand this net income number of a hundred thousand one of the expenses deducted in arriving at it was this depreciation expense of two thousand. Understand? But I want you to think about that. Come off that for a second. Did we really have a $2,000 cash outflow for that depreciation? Can you look at a check that we wrote for $2,000 for our depreciation? You see what I'm saying? It is what we call a non-cash expense. It was an expense on the income statement and it was deducted in arriving at net income, but there was really no cash outflow. It is a non cash expense. Understand? So what we have to do, what we have to do, we want to calculate our cash flows from operating activities. Okay? We want to come up with that number. Well, what we're going to have to do in this case is we're going to have to take the net income and in this case, how much was the net income? $100,000. And we're going to have to add back this depreciation expense of $2,000. Why do we add it back? Because it was deducted in arriving at that number. By us adding it back, we're negating the fact that that occurred. Does that make sense? It's a non-cash expense. It was deducted in arriving at this, but it's not, since it's not a cash outflow, we're going to add it back in trying to arrive at our cash flow from operating activities. Okay? Now, we do not do this with all expenses. We only do this with our non-cash expenses. And there are four non-cash expenses that we will deal with. The first of them I just told you. Depreciation. That is a non-cash expense. Does anybody want to make a guess on what? Amortization. Yes. Amortization. And what's the other expense that's related to depreciation and amortization? Depletion. Very good. Depletion. Now, let's remind ourselves what these are. These are all spreading out the expense over a reasonable amount of time to abide by the matching principle, right? Depreciation is in regards to fixed assets. Depletion is in regards to natural resources. <coughs> and amortization is in regards to intangible assets. But if you see one of these expenses on the income statement, you need to add it back in the manner that we did. There's one more non-cash expense. What that is, is call, it's bad debt expense if we use the accrual, um, the, the allowance method. Do you remember the allowance method of estimating bad debt expense in Chapter 9 of Accounting 1, Accounts Receivable? We estimate the bad debt expense, right? And that bad debt expense shows up on our income statement. And it's deducted in arriving in that income, but there was not a cash outflow for that bad debt expense. You with me? Okay. So, those are our four non-cash expenses. Now, we don't add back all of our expenses, though, folks. 
if you have salaries expense, it was deducted in arriving at this net income and we are okay with that. We do not add back salaries expense, for example. We only bet, add back our four non-cash expenses. Are you with me? So what we are going to do now, and I want to show you what I want you to do and I'm going to show you what I don't want you to do. You should have this handout right here. Okay? And each of these situations is totally separate from the other, but in each of these situations we're going to calculate the cash flows from operating activities. Now, let's do the very first one together. Okay, number, situation number one. Net income is 500 and depreciation is 39. Okay, what is our cash flow from operating, uh, operating activities? What's the answer? 539. It's 539. Okay, but I don't want you just to put 539 here. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to say net income is $500 plus depreciation expense that we add back of 39. Okay? Now here's the deal. If you do what I'm asking you to do, you're going to learn without even knowing it, you're going to learn how to do a cash flow statement. If you just try to get lazy and just put the answer there, or just put the numbers there and don't label them, you're not going to be learning what the objective of this whole day is, really is. Okay? You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to have computed numbers, but you're not going to know how to prepare a cash flow statement. And our objective is to learn how to prepare a cash flow statement. So don't be lazy. Don't just put the number write this out right here okay what I want you to do as they play the music is I want you to do numbers one through five one through five of this and I am going to you might have this folks at home in your handout but here are the check figures for numbers one well all, actually all of them but you can see specifically for now the check figures F one through five so let's play that music and let's do one through five and then we'll go over them
Okay, let's take a look at those answers. You had the check figures, right? Okay, so here are the answers. Now, don't just give me that, okay? Give me that, okay? Th notice on number four, I called that net cash used by operating activities. Now, if you on the test would have said, accidentally said net cash flows from operating activities, even though it's a negative number, I would not have subtracted. I would have not subtracted points from it. But that is the answers of one through five. Now, I gave you some cash expenses, did I not? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, don't add those back. Just add back the non-cash expenses. Okay. Any questions on any of those folks? No? Okay. Hop back over to the computer. We just, we just did this category right here, right? Now what we're going to do is we are going to deal with losses and gains. Okay? We're going to deal with losses and gains. Um, let me give you a little scenario. Okay? Let's say that, let's say we have a truck in our business, and let's say that the truck had cost originally $50,000, okay? And let's say that the accumulated depreciation on that was, let's say it's uh, $47,000. And so the book value of that truck is $3,000. Would you agree? Okay. And maybe that was our estimated salvage value. So maybe we depreciated it down to where the book value equals the estimated salvage value. Okay. Well, this is our situation. We're driving this truck on the highway and all of a sudden it, it, it starts smoking and making bad noises. It won't run. We pull over on the highway. Something's wrong with our truck. We have it towed into the shop. The guy calls us and said, hey, I looked at your truck. Bad news. This thing's in bad shape. Bad, bad, bad shape. It's going to take a lot of money to get this thing fixed. So you opt to just, it's been a good truck, but it's just, it's not worth fixing. Okay. So what you do is you don't even sell the truck. You just give it to charity. Have you ever done that? I did that with a van once. I gave it to charity. Have fun with it. Okay. So our business, we donate this truck to charity. Okay. Now let's prepare the journal entry to remove that book or that truck from our books. Okay, well, we would have to credit truck for 50000 right? We would also have to remove the related accumulated depreciation from the book. Now, this is all review from Accounting One, hopefully. You remember doing this? You remove the truck, you remove the accumulated depreciation. This is Truck is a debit balance account, so we have to credit it to take it off the books. Accumulated depreciations is a credit balance account, so we have to debit it to take it off the books. This journal entry does not balance. So what do we debit for $3,000? Loss on disposal. Now we've talked about losses and gains before, I think most recently in chapter 15 on investments. What are losses? Losses are kind of like expenses. They're debit balance accounts, they're temporary accounts, they're on the income statement, they're deducted and arriving at net income. Gains are kind of like revenues. They're temporary accounts with normal credit balances, they're on the income statement, they are, gains are added in arriving at net income. Correct? So this loss, going back to our income statement we looked at a little while ago, this loss might have been listed down here at $3,000 lost from disposal and that was deducted in arriving at this net income. This loss was. You see what I'm saying? But think back to that story about the truck. Was there a $3,000 cash outlay there? No, there was not, was there? And yet that loss was deducted in arriving at this number. <coughs> so what we have to do here is we have to, and I can't find my original piece of paper, but we have to add it back to net income, okay? Remember how I had net income of $100,000 and then we added the depreciation expense of 2000 
Now I'm going to add back our loss from disposal of $3,000 in arriving at this cash flows from operating. Are you with me? So look at this slide. Some people go, I think you made a mistake on this slide, Dave. You say to add the losses and subtract the gains. Don't you mean subtract losses and add gains? No, I do not mean that. We add back the losses because they were subtracted in arriving at net income, and we want to negate their effect. We subtract the gains because those gains were originally added in arriving at net income. Let me say that again. Losses were originally subtracted in arriving at net income, so we have to add them back. Gains were originally added, so we have to subtract them out. Okay? What about the uh, depreciation from the truck? Do you do anything with that? Well, if there's depreciation expense on the income statement, we would add it back like we did. Mm. But we would not look at the accumulated depreciation account. We would look at depreciation expense. Okay? Good question. Okay, what I want you to do now is numbers 6 through 10. Numbers 6 through 10 on your handout. Okay? And um, you have the check figures. I'll put them up again here in a second. You should have those in your packet, folks at home. And let's do 6 through 10. And go ahead and write out your work. Continue to write out your work, and we're going to build on what we learned with, with non-cash expenses, and now we're going to deal with gains and losses. So let's do 6 through 10 as they play that music.
All right, take a look. Uh, don't just show me that. Show me that. Okay. Did you guys get these answers? We're kind of just building on the knowledge that we've gained this period, aren't we? Okay. So are there any questions on any of those? Any questions on any of those? Take a look at them. You can see how I arrived at them. It's extremely easy to make a silly mistake in these, isn't it? It's very easy to make a dumb mistake. I don't want to say a dumb mistake, that's a little harsh. There's a lot of little errors that you could easily make, correct? All right. Okay, no questions on 6 through 10? Okay, let's go back to the computer. We've handled these first two categories. The last one we're going to deal with is we're, we're going to analyze the changes in current assets and current liabilities. Okay? Now we're only going to deal with current assets and current liabilities. Now we might need to refresh ourselves what are current assets and current liabilities. Well, current assets, current items are those expected to come due, both collected and owed, within one year. Remember we have current assets and we have current liabilities and then we also have non-current assets and non-current liabilities. We're only dealing in this step with the current assets and current liabilities, okay? As a reminder, and I think you have this in a handout, these are your current assets and current liabilities. You need to learn these. You, lear you use this so much in your business education. You need to know the current assets. And they're listed there. I'm not going to read them to you. You can read. You need to know your current liabilities. Those are also listed there. Okay? I promise you I will have a test question where I list out different assets and liabilities and you have to tell me if they're current or non-current. I promise you. I promise you. I promise you. I promise you. Because you need to know these. I just told my accounting one class the same thing. We're in chapter four. Okay? But what we're going to do is we are going to analyze the change in our current assets and current liabilities. And we are going to deal with the change according to this chart, which you also need to know. Let me tell you how we're going to do that. Let me give you an example. Let's say that we are looking at our balance sheet. Okay? And this is the beginning of the year balance, and this is the end <coughs> of the year balance, okay? So let's say, let's take accounts receivable, for example. Let's say accounts receivable at the beginning of the year was $32,000, and at the end of the year, it's $31,500. It's decreased by $500. Well... How would we deal with a decrease in accounts receivable from $32,000 to $31,500? Well, let's look at the chart. This is a current asset and it decreased. So we are going to add it to net income. Okay? We're going to add it to net income as I'm show going to show you right here we are going to say plus our decrease in accounts receivable of how much was it? 500? Because think about it. If your accounts receivable decreased, <coughs> chances are what happened? $500. You got cash, an inflow of $500. Okay? Let's do another one. Let's say down in the liability section, we have accounts payable and it was it was 12000 at the beginning of the year, and now it's gone down to uh, 11000 Okay, well that is a decrease from twelve to 11000 of a current liability, right? So what does our chart say to do? A decrease in a current liability, we should do what? Subtract, Subtract it from net income. So what we would do is, we would say, how much did it change by? A thousand? We would say minus decrease in accounts payable. 
I'll use parentheses to show a subtraction. Does that make sense? Now listen folks, we do not analyze all changes in all assets and liabilities. <coughs> So if I give you like a, a, an account called land or bonds payable, those are long-term accounts. We do not account for them in this manner, okay? This is just for current assets and current liabilities. We also, even though cash is a current asset, we do not analyze the change in cash in this section right here because you're going to find that the whole cash flow statement is an analysis of the change in cash. Are you with me? So you got to learn your current assets and your current liabilities so that you can follow this chart, okay? Now we're not going to have time to do the rest of the handout, but let's at least do a few of them. Let's at least see if we can get through the first couple. So let's start working on 11 through 20 of your handout while they play that music. Okay, I know you're not done and I didn't expect you to be, but let's at least, before we close shop today, at least go through and show the answers to, you know, 11 through 13 to see if you have any questions. Did I give you any long-term assets or long-term liabilities to try to fool you? I'll do that eventually. Remember, we don't analyze those changes in the operating section, okay? But there's the answers to 11, 12, and 13. Okay? All right, any questions on that, folks? Okay, let me talk about what I want you to do uh, for next time, okay? Well, I want you to finish the handout, okay? 
I want you to do all 20 of these, okay? And, you know, number 20 looks a little different, but I still want you to do it. It's, it's the same methodology, but it looks a little different. So do, do number 20, okay? Do the whole handout. Do all, make sure all 20 of these are done for next time. Remember that you have, you know, you have the check figures for what they should be, what the answers should be arrived at. Go ahead and show the detail. And then besides finishing up that handout, I want you to do this handout right here that you sh everybody should have. You all have this? This is time value of money. Remember time value of money? This is time value of money handout number three. All this is is we're just reviewing time value of money to get it back up to the top of your brain again as we approach the test. Now this was lecture 217. Our test is after uh, session 219, okay? So as soon as the cameras stop rolling, I'll tell you what day that is. But I don't want to say it on camera, it'll foul everybody up at home. So I want you to finish the handout and I want you to do time value money handout number three for next time. We only have two more lectures and then the test, okay? Bye-bye.